Thank you very much to Dan and, uh, and the panelists there. Um, really interesting chat. And I think now we're kind of, we're into our, our final specifically responsible um, gaming and harm prevention um, session of the day. Um, and uh, with pleasure, I announce Kim Morridson to the stage. Kim? Um, who is the uh, Associate professor, professor and Head of Neuroimaging Methods at MindLab and also the fine founder of, of MindWay AI. And um, I think it'd probably pick up on some of the data-related points that the, the panel was just talking about and, and dive into them with a bit more, a bit more detail. So over to you. A point or something here. Can you hear me? No? Yes. yes, good. Thank you so much for the invitation. If I look a little bit uh, pale, it's because of all the light, and you know, as a researcher, it can look a little bit funny when we actually get out of our natural environment. Um, anyway, I see that it's pretty close to, uh, to lunch, and, and as you can see uh, up there, I actually have uh, brain images, so if nothing else, then please enjoy uh, some talk about something that eventually ends up with uh, a talk about responsible gambling. Um, so, I want to show you, because everybody of course knows uh, who Mr. Green is, um, not as many uh, know uh, where the Danish uh, Neuroscience Research Center is in, in Denmark, and it's a building right up here. I'm an associate professor there, and most of my time actually is spent uh, on looking at images like, uh, like these ones. And, um, Many years ago, I also got into uh, working in the field of uh, responsible gambling. And I think that, um, you know, following up on the presentations that we have just seen, um, what we can um, ideally offer is, um, you know, an extension of what we have heard many times, that there's data, data, data. So my question would be, you know, what do we actually know about that data? So we have tons of data available, and we are working with operators who certainly have tons of data available. But the question to me is, you know, if, if we are only doing data mining, if we are just sort of slicing and dicing the, um, you know, the, uh, the population of, of gamblers, what do we actually know about the ones that we end up segmenting and, and we perceive as being at risk? And it's that connection, and that's where we want to bring in new neuroscience as a component to learn something more, not just about risk signals, but also about the customers that we are actually in dialogue uh, with. So um, this is certainly not a talk about you know, uh, neuroimaging, but there's an idea. There's an idea that we have used uh, extensively, and that's actually in optimizing clinical workflows. And I know that by now you probably think that I walked into the wrong room. But we have used AI um, as a vehicle to connect uh, neuroscience and then optimizing patient uh, workflow. And that idea is something that I believe we can, we can learn something from and implement uh, in the responsible gambling uh, situation. So, as I said, we have this long history of looking at and, and trying to understand how the brain works, uh, looking at brain metabolism, we're looking at neurotransmission and neuroconnectivity and so on. And then based off a lot of this research then in uh, here around uh, 2018, following a very long development uh, period with Danske Spil, Danish games, uh, we have now found it. Uh, we have now founded uh, Mindway AI. And as I said, what we're really, um, you know, trying to do is to connect basic research that we have on one side. So we are accumulating a lot of knowledge about how the brain works. We're also working with clinics, so we are trying to understand the behavior, in this case, in problematic or pathological gambling. And then we want to connect that sort of with the real world and make actions based on, on, on that. And it turns out that, you know, a good vehicle for that is artificial intelligence. So that's how they are connected. And if I could just show you one example, um, you know, before the launch here about how we have worked and how we have connected those two realms uh, previously. Then there's a case here from uh, acute stroke. So acute stroke is an emergency clinical setting where there's an occlusion of a neck artery and then brain uh, tissue starts to die off immediately and therefore you need to treat the patient as quickly as possible. 
And, and that means that the, the patient arrives at the hospital and needs a scan. And then the scanner, just as you know, we have here in, 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 the, in the gambling situation, there's really tons and tons of data. And these scanners, they produce more and more data, uh, more and more you know, nuanced uh, you know, views on what, what's happening in the brain. And then a poor uh, you know, MD over here at 4 o'clock in the morning needs to make a life and death uh, decision based on actually more data than it's reasonable to expect um, that he can make a, an informed decision from. And here's the key idea that, that we are bringing. So we want essentially machines to start learning from this data on one hand and then learning from the experts or from the physicians on the other hand. And that's exactly what I'm, I'm trying to show here, and, and I think this is one of the last uh, brain imaging slides. So we have some, some, some images that come in here, and you can think of these, you know, these are what will become gambling data uh, later on. So we have input images coming in here, and then the physician, you can imagine, is reading the images and finding out where is the pathology in the brain, and, and later that would be where do we see risk in a gambling pattern. And then we have a machine here, and the machine is sort of learning from the expert, and you can see that over time, the machine learns to basically do the same that the expert is doing. And all this is based on a strong computational algorithm, so it's based on artificial intelligence, something that I'm particularly um, you know, uh, intrigued about because I'm also a, a neuroscientist. And, and what's interesting here is that no matter whether we put in brain images or, or, or gambling trajectories, um, we have a, a sort of a mathematical structure here which ends up mimicking the way that the human brain is working. And that's probably the reason that we now see that the computer and, and the expert has just about the same performance. So it seems that the technology now is flexible enough to encapsulate or encode sort of the complex decision patterns of uh, the human brain. So let me skip to, um, to gambling now. So of course, I mean, there's no need to, to educate you in, in, in what the problems are. They are pretty, uh, pretty obvious. They are also sort of first lines of, of defense. So we, uh, we can try to, um, to, to set limits on, on losses and, and their self-tests and, and their pop-up messages and so on. So we, we have a lot of tools in, in the back. And certainly, um, I think Mr. Green has done a terrific job in, in really extending um, this battery of uh, of, of tools, but there's one problem here that, that, that I still see, and one is that the way that we sort of slice and dice the population is based either on what I would call threshold, so it's based on, say, you know, if you are gambling more than a certain number of hours or spending a certain amount of money, then we put you in the risk category, and that is likely too simple, just as, you know, in you know, our brain imaging, it's too simple to say, you know, if there's one bright spot spot, then that's a brain lesion. That's probably uh, overly simplified. And the same with data mining, you know, we can do more complicated thresholding. That's basically what data mining is doing. But still, we don't know that much uh, about the, uh, the, the group that we segment out. So let me try to show that in, in an illustration here. So, you know, what we are seeing is that many operators are looking at a couple of, of, of risk markers and then they're basically saying, you know, if you score higher on one of the markers and low on the other, then you are at, at risk, then you're in a risk group out here. But the question is, how much do we actually know then? Um, so, so one thing is that we, we, we just know that they are more extreme than the other players. And probably a dangerous uh, even thing about that is that we become sort of uh, agnostic to what's happening everywhere else in the database. So that's probably where the, uh, you know, the pathological or the problematic patterns are developing. And that's probably also where tools like uh, Mr. Green and others have developed might be even more effective because you can say for the most extreme group, those are probably also the gamblers that are hardest to reach in, in, in any way. Of course, not suggesting that we shouldn't reach them, but the effect might be even stronger in other groups. 
So of course there's you know, good reasons for, uh, for the approach that's taken today, and I see a lot of these studies um, that, that form the basic of, of why we are doing this kind of decision making. I'm just trying with this slide to illustrate um, you know, how traditionally we go from research and then to practice. So, you know, typically there will be a research study and, and it will be a control study where there will be a number of, uh, you know, normal subjects, so to speak. And then there will be a group which we know are problem gamblers. And then when we start to measure on, on, let's say, one marker, then we can certainly see that there are more problematic gamblers, you know, who score low on this risk marker than there are controls. And then that would give rise to the, you know, um, to, to the effect that, you know, we'd say, well, then we basically have to look, you know, for low values of this marker out here. But the problem is that in real life, we don't know, of course, who are the problematic gamblers. So conversely, if you only tell me the value of this one risk marker, it's, you can see it's much more difficult to pick out because there are also some that are problematic up here. So of course, the landscape is more difficult than that. And that means that the only thing we can really do is to say, well, there's some sort of gradient here. So the lower we get here, the higher uh, the, the risk that you fall in, in some uh, specific group. Now, the key idea that, that we are trying to, to pursue here is that, you know, experts over time, of course, have come up with one indicator and another indicator, and maybe there's a modulator here that says, well, you know, if there's a certain combination and so on, um, then, then that lowers the risk a little bit. So what we are trying to do instead is to kind of bring the expert to the individual. So we show, and I'll show you in, in, in a second how that's actually done. So we actually try to let the expert look at the individual player data. And then based on sort of a full 360 degree uh, evaluation of the customer behavior, then let the expert give an opinion for that particular case. So not a population based statement, but a statement or a risk score for the individual. And the way that is done is that we have, we have a database, um, we uh, create a sample or select a sample from that database, and then we ask our experts to look not just at a, at a few markers, but actually at the uh, original and even spin level data. And we are showing to, to the experts in, in a very detailed and graphical format. And it's, you know, it's, it's actually interesting to sit with the experts when they are doing this, because the minute you show them these graphs, so for, for data protection reasons, of course, I cannot show you real data, but once they see this data, they immediately start to more or less describe the customer journey, and they understand from their experience from research and from the clinic and, 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 and the cognitive th therapy and so on, they can immediately spot uh, any risk signs. And, and the, you know, the good thing here is that then it's not limited to just a few risk markers. It's based on a total and, in a sense, um, analog, if you will, assessment of an entire gaming pattern. Uh, taking all personal, you could say, so all the information we have available goes into that decision for the individual. Now, of course, um, this could not happen. Of course, the experts that, that, that we are working with couldn't do that on anything that's remotely a, a routine basis. So we select a sample, and this is where the AI then comes in, because now we have gambling patterns on, on the one side, and you'd really be surprised to see how heterogeneous they can be, which also means that fresh zone is probably not the way to go. And then we use um, the artificial intelligence here, so basically the same algorithm, you could say, that we used for, for the brain imaging. So a heavy-duty technology that can now learn to make the same assessments that the experts are doing. And I spent a long time creating this slide, so, so you have to see it. So that means that now we have a tool which digitizes, if you will, the expert opinion. And that means that in, in almost real time now, we can scan, of course, an entire database and uh, get you know, um, evidence-based uh, evaluations for each individual customer. So of course, what we see here is that Yes, I mean, if, if you're in this region here, then it's dominated by problem gamblers, but we also find many other profiles. And the good thing here is that, you know, we actually have expert opinion, so we can also measure the accuracy of such an algorithm. And that's one of the other problems or challenges, you could say, with a purely data-driven approach, is that it's really hard to say how accurate it is. So there are some, some numbers here, and 
I'm happy to go into more detail, but overall, if you look at the accuracy, so how well does the algorithm um, conform to the expert opinion for individual subjects, the overall accuracy is just uh, around 88%. Uh, and there's a, a figure here where I've tried to illustrate that these are the greens and, and the amber and, and, the, uh, and the reds, so these are obviously the, the problem gambling um, customers, and you can see that they are sort of nicely organized along this axis. It also means that we can differentiate um, the intervention. So, of course, one type of intervention would be appropriate. That would probably be direct dialogue with these people up here, whereas, you know, pop-up messages, emails, uh, notching, and so on would, would be more uh, feasible in this, uh, in this realm uh, of, of the space. So an important thing here is that, you know, after doing the data mining and after doing sort of the uh, expert or the digitized expert, we, we cannot leave the operator there. We cannot leave the customer hanging there just knowing that there's a problem. So what we have also done is that we have connected the AI machine with something we call uh, care scripts. So that's individualized uh, and tailored uh, scripts for the operator to use in the dialogue with the customer. So not only do we find that certain customers might have a, a problem uh, gambling issue, but they also differ a lot and different types of problem gamblers need to be intervened with in different and tailored ways. And that's something we have uh, worked a lot on. And, um, our experience is now from around 1,200 care calls that this is something that's really well uh, received by the customers. And this is, in a sense, a little bit surprising because we are directly calling the customer and saying, you know, that there might be a problem. We have seen a change in your behavior. So that they afterwards say that this is actually, you know, they, they are uh, happy about this call is something that we find really encouraging. So. I hope I'm also allowed to just show a, a couple of the awards. We, we have one for the technology, if I uh, hurry on and go to um, the, the summary here. So we do see a need for solutions um, that can more precisely, so in, instead of just saying, you know, in the lower corner there's a problem, so more precise detection, earlier detection, and that detection should be based not only on pure data mining, but connected to the research, to the expert opinion, and that should be digitized. And after that, we should have a tailored dialogue with the customer, and that's exactly the system that, that we have developed here. We continue to develop it, and our preferred model is that we enter into a, a partnership with an operator where we see what are the best opportunities for improving and sort of getting a digital expert into that particular framework. So that's just an off-the-shelf algorithm. It's an ongoing going development with the operator. So thank you for your attention, and I hope that at least you enjoyed the brain imaging. Thank you very much. Before you leave the stage, have you got any questions for Kim before he, he leaves the stage? Let's see. Yeah. Hi. Bryce uh, Busson from Gaming Block. I'm not an expert about that, but uh, I read in some occasion was a professor called uh, Bruce Alexander who made a famous experiment with, uh, it's called the, the Rat Park, to, to demonstrate that any addiction, for example, drug addiction, is provoked by the broken relationships of the people or poor quality of relationship that this kind of people try to replace with some topic, object of desire, like alcohol or drugs or like that. If this is true, maybe we are not addressing correctly the responsible gaming. Maybe the solution of addiction is not play less, maybe it's more love. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and you can say that as long as they are gambling, they are not doing anything that's worse than that. So we, we understand that. And, and, and you're right that that's one component. And in some cases, this is what we call self-medication. So they're simply escaping from other sorts of problems. And that's exactly why we devised the 
tailored care calls because that means that then we can discover more closely through you know, connecting the AI and, and the gambling pattern and then in the dialogue uncover what is really the reason for this problematic gambling behavior that we're seeing. So self-medication is, is one issue. There are many other issues. So another uh, known component of, uh, of gambling that we don't see with other drug addictions uh, is uh, impulse control that's missing. And that's a whole other pathology in the brain. And, and therefore, you can say pathological gambling or problem gambling spans many different subtypes or latent types. And I think it's important that we identify them and then tailor the dialogue and the intervention so exactly we can solve the or, or help uh, solve the problem in the, in the right way so I agree with you any more questions from the audience it, just a quick one from me um, mm -hmm. just to follow up on some of the stuff you're saying and the work you've been doing with Danska spill um, is this from a data perspective and, and, and the, for the operators in the room how hard is it to get the data together to, for you allowed to, to, to do your job properly in terms of yeah. you know, labeling up customers and, and segmenting them? Is that, is that you know, for, again, for the operators, is that part of the, the issue you, you face when trying yeah. to do the work you're doing? It's actually surprisingly easy. Um, because, because most operators have data structured and organized in, in, in a very tidy way. So this is actually relatively uh, easy. We, by far, the, the, the most of the work that we have done has not been spent on collecting data. That, that has actually been the easy part. It's also a system that runs with the operator as a back-end solution. So there's no need to send data. We don't operate a cloud or something like, like that. So everything is you know, back-end with the operator, which from a data perspective also something that's uh, comforting, okay. but good question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Kim. <laughs> Cheers.